two of our board members here are quite historians said, well, we could get, put together a program of probably the oldest business that we're ever going to talk about. And so I'm, obviously you're interested. So Michelle said, two comments are giving you the program today. Thanks for coming. Um, and yeah. just a little backstory on why this program came to be and how it came to be. About a year and a half ago, we had a journalist come to town to do a story about the revitalization of downtown Grand Island. And he wanted to meet the historical society, which we did. And then he called me later and was asking questions about um, downtown, specifically prostitution. I said, well, it really isn't an area that I do research on. That's not one of my focuses. <laughs> But I've heard a few stories, and so I told a few stories, and the next thing I know, I'm listed as Grand Island's expert on the history of prostitution. <laughs> I am grateful that he also called me not an old-timer, so that was good. But the board thought, you know, that was hilarious, and so then it kind of became this joke that we would do this program, and I said, well, I'm not doing it by myself. I'll only do it if Sue does it with me, so I drug her along. So we're going to start talking about this. Um, we're going to kind of trade back and forth a little bit. And you'll notice from the slide, we are only talking about uh, 1870 to 1920, the first 50 years. Um, I'm sure all of you know, you've heard stories. Prostitution, of course, continued long beyond 1920 in Grand Island. Um, but 50 years is a lot to cover anyway, and we could still talk for days and days and days on just that first 50 years. So we try to figure out how to condense it and get it done in under an hour. So we're talking about Grand Island and the world's oldest profession. I'm going to lead it off with Sue. Well, one of the earliest references to prostitution or a prostitute is found in the Bible, the book of Joshua, where the prostitute Rahab uh, aids the two spies sent by Joshua to scope out what's happening in Jericho because he has got an order to destroy it, and he needs more information because it's a huge city. So they went to uh, the house of Rahab, the prostitute, because they figured that, uh, well, it's natural if you're a visitor to find the local brothel, and so no one would notice that they were there. Uh, which turned out to be wrong, because she had to sneak them out of her window. And But before she uh, let them go, she had them promise that when they came back, that nobody in her family would be killed. And so they promised, and that was that happened because of uh, their help to her, to them. She and her family are spared from the otherwise complete slaughter of every living thing in the city. So Rahab probably lived about 3,400 years ago, about. And when Matthew, in the New Testament, lists the forebears of Jesus, he only names three women, Mary, Ruth and Rahab in his ancestral tree. So in the Roman controlled Ephesus, and Ephesus was a huge city. It was controlled by Rome. It's in what is now Turkey. It was a big seaport. It had thousands of people visiting all the time. And um, a 2,000 year old stone was found, which is a map to a brothel. Now think how useful that would be. You've got new ships in town every day, people from all over the world, or the Mediterranean at least, speaking many different languages, so we'll put up a sign. And here's a picture of that sign. Now here's a picture. I see the red thing going up there. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Oh, well. I'll point. <laughs> First of all, here's a, here's a picture of a beautiful lady. I don't know, you know, the best picture I could get. We take while I was there. But it, uh, there's a beautiful lady, she has a fancy headdress or maybe it's a fancy hairdo. So once that catches the, it's, it's kind of the equivalent of the hey sailor of World War II, I think. And above that, in the, the circle, is the symbol for an intersection. It's a cross. And so the foot tells you what direction to go. So what direction are we going to go when we get to the intersection? Look at the foot. It's the left so when you get to the intersection, you go left, and you go to, you see the building with that mark on it, and that's where you go. Well, archaeologists found the stone, and they followed the directions, and lo and behold, 
they found a two, the, the remains of a two-story brothel at that location. And when we went to the basement, there was a tunnel which led to the library, about two blocks away. That's the picture I took of the library. So you could go to the library, visit the brothel, if that's what you wanted to do, go back to the library. Where have you been? Well, I've been to the library. <laughs> So, <laughs> I heard somebody say sneaky, I'm not sure. So we discovered that in ancient histories that prostitution was acknowledged as a more or less legitimate profession. As time passed, this legitimacy was called into question and finally reversed. By the time we find ourselves in Hall County in the mid-1800s, attitudes and laws have changed a great deal. But before we fall in a full-time condemnation, we have to understand that in the time period, the life of a woman who is not under the protection of a man could be very difficult indeed. If, um, if your husband dies, a widow who did not have children old enough to help him with the farm work or the family business, or they can become destitute very quickly. If your husband is killed on the railway, that's the last day you get a paycheck. And so uh, life insurance, there's no social safety net, and life insurance was almost non-existent. In fact, when my great-grandfather died suddenly in 1908, he left his 39-year-old widow with uh, her six of their seven children still at home, but he had left a $2,000 life insurance policy. And this was an occurrence rare enough that it was mentioned in his obituary. But a woman thrown upon her own resources had few options, especially if she was uneducated or if she had small children that she had to feed and clothe and look after. So um, nobody actually, well, very few people actually chose this as a, an occupation, but some were found themselves there regardless. Being a laundress or seamstress could only earn so much. And teenage runaways were also vulnerable. They would, uh, if the proprietor of a house offered them a place to stay and a meal or two a day, they maybe found out too late what they'd actually signed up for. And in some cases, believe it or not, we, saw, we found this in the records. Uh, the prostitution was the family business. It was already, already, already practiced by a mother or an aunt. Oh, sorry, that's too late. Grand Island grew up at a time when the brothel was the most common supplier for prostitution, both in the U.S. and in Europe. The owner of the house was sometimes a woman, sometimes a couple, sometimes a man who then hired a woman to manage it. Owning a house was a major investment. It required the building itself, then you had to pay property taxes, then you had to keep up the property, there was maintenance, so some people rented houses to use for their business of prostitution. There were different classes of brothels. Some catered to the well-to-do, some aimed at a more modest clientele and their furnishings and their prices, we'll talk more about that later, varied accordingly. Each house provided a common area where there could be music and drinking, maybe dancing, Gambling, however, was usually not available in the brothel itself and was in fact illegal to be there. Uh, in a town the size of Grand Island, most of the houses would be grouped together in more or less the same vicinity, while in Omaha and Lincoln, they would still be grouped in the same vicinity, but there would be several groups. They varied according to the, uh, the population that was there. Most were operated as private clubs. But any man who behaved himself and was ready to spend his money would usually be welcomed. Some houses employed bouncers in case a customer made a scene, in case a customer mistreated one of the soiled doves. That's an 18th century uh, term for the 1800s term for a prostitute. The first house of ill repute in Grand Island was owned by a man named William Henry Anderson. His nickname was Jack. He was a Civil War veteran who served in Wyoming and Nebraska after the war. He opened, he's kind of an interesting guy. I have some of this up here so I can figure out this laser pointer. 
See, where does it go? <laughs> okay. Jack served as a cavalry during the Civil War. When the war was over, he mustered out in two months, and then he said, uh, what was it he said? He got bored. He got bored. So he re <laughs> And this time he was sent in the regular army, he was sent to the western part of the U.S., which in that time was Nebraska, he was in Wyoming. And Nebraska, he might have been at Fort Kearney, because we heard rumors, but we didn't find anything documented. But we do know he was in Omaha, and in, uh, and somewhere he acquired a wife, and he arrived in Grand Island in February of 1870 and opened the first brothel in Grand Island. He, uh, he, owned, he owned it, he and his wife owned it, and he operated a saloon downtown while Anna was the house manager. He, um, he, the, home, the house he opened was so far out on the prairie well, oh, there you go. So far out of the prairie that it was called this, this was the, the prairie, prairie house. house. This is 1890. Yeah, and here is the railroad track. And here is the prairie house. It was approximately yeah. Fifth and Elm. It was torn down when they built the new, well, new at the time, Grand Isle Senior High School, and which in turn was uh, converted to Old Walnut Junior High right across the street from where Trinity and his church is today. So that was his prairie house. And that was the center or the area where prostitutes were located, where the brothels were located in Grand Island. So um, Jack, uh, he, let's see, in 1878, I'm thinking he got bored again because he left for uh, the Black Hills in Sydney. And then he was there for a while. And uh, then he came back in 1878, so now he and Anna are back there again. Well, and I have to tell you, the fact that we've been, we, most of the lot, Michelle and our Hall County Board, have been working on the digitization of newspapers in Hall County, because this has already got this information. Madam Anderson, in the paper, left town in 1891 with a Grand Island police officer who was 30 years younger than she. And when they got to Ogden, Utah, they got married. So, and she'd been married 22 years to Jack. So uh, she came back, but by 1894, she was back. No police officer, they didn't know where he was. But she was back, and she resumed running the prairie house. Okay, so that area that we kind of talked about with Prairie House, that little map right there around um, the high school, um, that actually, Prairie House was the first one there, but it wasn't the last house there. Um, shortly after the Andersons came, there was another establishment, uh, another husband-wife team. He owned, opened a saloon downtown, just like Jack Anderson. By the way, Jack Anderson's saloon point this out was uh, the first floor of a, a two-story building. The second floor of his building was the independent offices. <laughs> the Mobleys owned the building. He operated the saloon out of the first floor. But um, uh, John and Sarah Gettle came to Grand Island. John opened a saloon downtown, opened another establishment out um, in this same area with Sarah operating it. Um, and the area became known as the Burnt District. Now, the Burnt District, that was one of the things that kind of puzzled us. Why was it called a Burnt District and was there a fire? Um, what I found was the term Burnt District is not really unique to Grand Island. Actually, there were several different communities that I found had the name Burnt District. Lincoln, Omaha, um, Butte, Montana. Um, and I, I never really found out why it was called the Burnt District, except I did find something that talked about a reference to uh, the Book of Leviticus talking about um, burning in hell, but, um, but anyway, so the Burnt District, as it became known, and it was published a lot about as the Burnt District, there were other houses that became um, in that area, including those of Molly Scott, Fanny Perry, Kate Beckman, who were all indicted in 1884, <laughs> along with Sarah Gettle and Anna Anderson for operating houses of ill fame. Um, if you wanna know more about life of the women at this time, in this era, 
there was a journalist, and she wrote for the Omaha World Herald. Her name was Aliyah Petty. Uh, she wrote a lot about um, things that interested her, things that weren't being talked about a lot in the news, a lot of human interest stories. Uh, she had a column in the World Herald, and she wrote a lot about prostitution, especially in Lincoln and Omaha. And this was kind of interesting, because she was talking about the burnt districts there, and an attempt in 1894 to clean up prostitution in Lincoln. And in this article, I thought this was interesting, we thought we had to throw it in, she was talking about the 200 prostitutes in Lincoln as they were cleaning them up, would certainly move on to other communities, Grand Island included, around Nebraska, stay away for a brief period of time until the village, uh, the police kind of relaxed their, their um, vigilance, yes. And then they would return because then they would have to be back in business in Lincoln before the next session of the legislature resumed. <laughs> yeah. So um, these are a couple articles that we found about um, houses in the Burden District. These are some of the keepers that we know. And we found these, uh, these people from different records. We found them from newspapers. We found them from census records. We found them from court records. We know at, at this period of time, there were at least seven keepers. And they were called keepers. They weren't necessarily called madams. They were called keepers in the, in the official records of houses of ill fame in the Burnt District. Now, there was one, and I want to talk about this for just a second. Her name was Bertie Mann. And Bertie um, was actually brought to trial um, because she had allowed a gentleman and woman, C. E. Lewis and Clara Williams, to engage in a room of her in her house for no good purpose. And this was from the newspaper. <laughs> um, Bertie said, you know, she kept a house that was very luxurious with furniture, for, um, and these rooms were very luxurious rooms and and really well furnished rooms. And she rented these rooms out, but she denied that they were being used for the purpose of prostitution. Um, but she did say that 50 to 75 men, she just couldn't remember how many for sure, um, had simply stopped to see her elegant furniture. <laughs> and the two other women living in the house were just her housekeeper and her cook. Well, in 1895, uh, Bertie decided to depart the Burnt District in Grand Island. And the newspaper actually suggested that the notorious Bertie man had shaken Grand Island dust off of her slippers and shipped her household goods to Omaha to return from whence she came. So I guess any men who wanted to look at her furniture had to go to Omaha after that. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't only the police that uh, sought to halt business in that district. Nellie Thompson uh, swore out complaints, and that's um, part of one of those articles, against four other keepers and 14 inmates. So these were the ladies living in the house. They were the inmates, the ladies, the people operating the house were the keepers. So Nellie Thompson swore out complaints when she was arrested against four other keepers and 14 other inmates of houses in the Burnt District um, because she said that she had the right to follow the nefarious business if others in the same vicinity were permitted to do the same. So if she was going to be brought to trial, she was going to make sure everyone else was brought to trial at the same time. So the ladies of the Burnt District. And these are, again, inmates. This is a name of the ones that we know during this time. This is the 1880s, 1890s. It's quite an extensive list, actually, if you consider the population of Grinnell at the time. Um, and some of these we found from census records. And Sue talked a little bit about the Curry House. So over here on um, your right, your, your left, um, we have the 1880 census from Prairie House, which was the Anderson's property, and the 1885 Nebraska State Census from Prairie House. Now remember, there is no 1890 census because it was destroyed in the fire. But it's interesting to note, and you, it might be hard to read here, but it, it does have you know, William Anderson, Anna, and all of these ladies who are living there. They're listed as um, servants. <laughs> Of the 1885 census, they actually had occupations in that one. We had a seamstress, we had a dressmaker, a milliner, a milliner, a cook. Um, so they had really mundane descriptions for their um, occupations. And, and remember that, because that's going to be important later on when we talk in the presentation. But I want to kind of touch a little bit on some of the, 
The interesting things we found about some of these ladies living in the Bird District, so Haley Montague was one of them. In 1885, she was arrested, and the newspaper actually said she was arrested for being a soiled dove, they used that word, who was caught being naughty. <laughs> so Haley Montague was naughty, and uh, she was fined $15 plus costs. Dora Reynolds, who had a complaint filed against her in police court by Lucy Paxton, now again, this was a prostitute who was filing a complaint against another prostitute. So Lucy Paxton says that Dora Reynolds rented out a room in the Nelson house for the purpose of prostitution. So she filed a complaint against her for that in June of 1897. And she said Reynolds knew exactly for what purpose that room was being used for. And Paxton knew exactly what purpose that room was being used for because Paxton and George Wilson, another prostitute, had previously rented out that room. So I know what she's doing there because I used it too. <laughs> um, the following year, Reynolds was arrested again. Actually, she's been arrested several times, not always for prostitution. She actually stole a hat from the milliner's shop. Um, but Reynolds apparently was a real handful in Grand Island. So the last time she was arrested, um, she was fined $20 plus costs. Um, but she was told that the, the sentence would be suspended against her um, if she would leave Grand Island within 48 hours. They would suspend her sentence. Basically, just get the heck out of here. We're done with you. Um, interestingly enough, though, the person who was arrested with her she was arrested uh, and fined $20 and told to get out in 48 hours. Emily Brown was also arrested. She was fined $15, again, told to get the heck out of town. She was given nine days, though. Um, she was Dora Reynolds' mother. So that was a mother-daughter operation. So Emily and Dora left her out and went to Omaha with Dora's two children and set up shop there. Um, Annie Burns. I love this one, and I love how sometimes the articles in the newspapers, they're, they're being sly, but they're not really sly. Um, Annie Burns was uh, arrested for being a disreputable woman, and she was arrested with a supposed Adonis. I guess he was good looking. <laughs> um, he gave the police the name of Hutchinson. He said his name was Hutchinson. Um, and they were both arrested, and they hadn't gone to court yet, and they were both being held in the jail. But the next morning, amazingly, they discovered that Annie was gone. Someone had opened her cell from the outside, and she escaped. So um, they began searching for her, but, but Hutchinson, you know, he's, he's an okay guy, he told a straight story, and he said, you know, this woman, she just given him some work to do around the place, and he had slept there, but he slept in a room all by himself. And they're like, okay, you know what, you're fine. Just go on. Just get out of town. And so he did get out of town. So he didn't get charged. He didn't get fined because he didn't do anything wrong, you know. Yeah, he slept there, but it was by himself. Uh, Cora Roberts, she came to Grand Island from Des Moines in 1894. And this is kind of an interesting story. And again, this is not a life that necessarily people choose. They kind of fall into it. So 1894, Cora Smith came to Grand Island from Des Moines. Her story is really interesting because she was actually running from the law when she came to Grand Island. She and her mother had poisoned her father <laughs> in Des Moines and killed him. And so she was on the run. They caught up with her. Um, and then she was sentenced to prison, life in prison, in 1895. However, a kind of a sad story of Cora Smith, which a lot of them ended up being sad stories. Three years into her sentence, she committed suicide in prison. She had been collecting live spiders in her handkerchief, and then she ate them, and they killed her. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it was not always such a wonderful life. But ladies in this Burton district, they could expect to make about two to three dollars per transaction. Um, and there was a lot of business in this area. You'd be really surprised how much business there was. And one of the, the big areas of business was there was a reunion that was held in Grand Island. I don't know if it was held every year, a few years it came to Grand Island, but it was old soldiers that came to Grand Island. They had this reunion and they had their encampments, and their encampments just happened to 
camp on the side of town where the brothels were. So it was reported in the newspaper that one of the madams after one of these reunions reported that she made $700. So remember, they make two to three dollars per transaction. I'll let you do the math on that. <laughs> Okay, so Grand Island, it really did try to regulate prostitution. So the first ordinance for the regulation of prostitution was passed in 1881, and there was a $25 fine for keepers and a $15 fine for inmates and <coughs> frequenters. Inmates actually lived in the houses, frequenters just kind of rented a room. Um, and the proceeds from this were actually used to fund the schools. Now this is where I kind of got into trouble with the reporter from the, the magazine because I had made this lame joke, and you don't make a lame joke to a reporter unless you want it to be reported. <laughs> but I told him this story, and I said, you know how we tax alcohol and cigarettes today? He didn't say prostitution was Grand Island's early sin tax. <laughs> and, and he published it. <laughs> Lesson learned. Robert, wherever you are, don't publish that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so following the passage of the ordinance, a pattern began to emerge. Like I said, they arrested them. Um, they would bring them into court. They would fine them. Um, everyone was fined usually once a month. Oftentimes, the madam would go ahead and pay those fines. As long as they behaved properly, um, the police didn't trouble them too much during the rest of the time. This type of regulation and this type of process, though, is not unique to Grand Island during this time. I just want to let you know that. Um, this kind of whole, you do your business, we'll kind of turn a blind eye once a month, you know, you pay us, and then go back and do your business. Because I actually found an article about Hastings. That's not Hastings, not Grand Island. And there was a woman named Anna Fetter in Hastings who sued the city of Hastings for $10,000 in damages for allowing a soil dove coat, so an area with soil doves, to exist within close proximity of her property. She alleged the city received monthly revenue from the, the coat and would therefore be responsible for paying her damages to her health for her health and her mind uh, of body, mind and body. Did she get it? I don't know if she got it or not. <laughs> Alright, I feel like I've got this long thing going on here. Okay, so Grand Island, um, apparently the regulations that the, the city were taking on were not enough for some people. So there was this organization that was started in 1888 called the White Cross League. And the White Cross League, um, it was a group that was formed primarily by members of the religious community, um, their ministers, the congregations, and they made these following resolutions, and these were actually published in the newspaper. <coughs> so I'll just read a couple of the resolutions. It says, there, whereas there has been and now exists in our midst certain evils greatly damaging the purity of morals um, and our open violation of our laws, both human and divine, whereas recent efforts have been made to remove the evils in which an effort of majority of ministers of the gospel and a large class of respectable citizens are engaged, Whereas certain ministers have been singled out and held up to ridicule, their works and acts impugned and misrepresented. Therefore, it be resolved that every house of prostitution or ill fame in our city is a stain and a blot upon its good name and must and shall be removed. Resolved that every minister of the gospel is and shall be or should be among the first to act and speak out on this as on all of the questions of moral reform. So the members of the White Cross League, they were asked to sign a purity pledge. And it looked something like this. Um, and basically it said for, to, for men to keep themselves pure, to treat women with respect, to put down indecent language, maintain laws of purity, keep themselves pure, spread these principles. Well, there was this war kind of going on between the White Cross League and other people. So members of the White Cross League, um, there were, of course, as you have with any other organization, more moderate-minded individuals and more radical-minded individuals. Well, the more radical-minded individuals um, were kind of led up or stirred up by a man by the name of uh, Charles Williams. 
who happened to run the newspaper, The Times, which was a, ri a rival of the Independent. So there was already kind of this coordinates nest going on here. There was also a lot of um, moral high ground that was being taken that maybe wasn't necessarily due to the individuals that were taking it. Um, so Fred Hetty, who was the publisher of The Independent, he had different thoughts on what that purity pledge should read based on the actions of some of the members. So he wrote his own purity pledge for them. And he said the way it ought to read, and I'm only going to read a couple of these. Number one, treat all women with suspicion, and if, if, they, um, if thy suspicions are strong, with thy um, firebrand and scorch, do therein great wrong and possible, it, and if possible, increase their degradation. To maintain the law of purity as of no binding effect upon men as being made for women only. Ouch. Yeah. And this is Fred Hetty saying this is what it should read based on the way you're all acting. Use the words, use all possible means to fulfill the commandment. Keep thy neighbor pure, not keep thyself pure. Even going to the extent of absolute force and move low in order to purify his heart. And then they added in number six, which there was no number six on the original one. All impure women will I drive out of my city, but all impure men shall be the delight of my soul, and not a word I will utter that shall by any possibility reflect upon any of my brothers of the White Cross League, purity being not essential to me, and particularly if he be in my set. So, so again, you know what? It takes two to tango. And these women were here, but someone was visiting them, and it wasn't just the people visiting town on occasion. So the White Cross League, um, it actually had originated in England, and these were actual headlines from the newspaper. Social purity, the sanctified and some unsanctified, hold a lively meeting at the First Baptist Church. Nothing against the First Baptist Church here. They hold meetings all over town. Um, they would like meet at different locations, different times. Um, discuss the proposition whether to begin the reform on themselves, the city, the government, or the independent, and finally determine the mayor and the independent of the objective point of their aim. So they were after the mayor and the independent. Uh, I love this one. They adjourn without any decisive action, and sin still stalks abroad. <laughs> and sinners and saints uh, seek their respective homes. And they actually tried to dismiss a reporter from the independent from one of the meetings. They tried to hold closed door meetings. And if you weren't a member of the league, they were going to shut everyone out and have secret meetings. Apparently, some of the more moderate members of the association voted against that. So, um, so yeah, they actually also tried during the, this period of time to um, have members of the league uh, elected to school board, elected to city council. They all failed in the elections. Um, and this is interesting, and I don't know how they did this or thought they were going to do this, the White Cross League actually had lawsuits filed on behalf of the state against Maggie Mustard and Sarah Gettle, who were known madams. Um, and they actually had their lawyer defending the cases in court. Now, they weren't government. This was just an organization, a private organization. Um, the judge, apparently, who was allowing this to happen, was not a district court judge, and so it was ruled that he had no authority and the cases were actually thrown out. Um, yeah. So the White Cross League was pretty short-lived in Grand Island. And about as quickly as it came, it left. It was only here about 1888. In the early to mid-1890s, now conditions began to change. Platt Elementary School had been constructed in the neighborhood, resulting in children walking to and from school, right by or through the burn district. New residents were more likely to be families. A new mayor was elected on the promise of no new brothels, and that measure was supported both by the public and by existing brothel owners. They were on the same page here because the depression of the 1890s had uh, cut into everyone's income. And, by, and uh, so new competition was not welcomed. An existing, an existing man, Mel Thompson, probably backed by a new resident, he showed up from Omaha for whatever reason, uh, he either, uh, 
Nell had either moved into, or she might have already been there and just wanted to open up a new house, but she was arrested and she retaliated, as uh, Michelle pointed out, by filing about 14 lawsuits against the other keepers. And that was uh, unfortunate because that made all the keepers and the inmates uh, conspicuous to the public. And if you're quiet and fly under the radar, that's uh, a better thing for them than be out there reading about yourself in the paper every day. So eventually, this uh, resulted in a petition signed by 61 residents of the city's fourth ward, which was the ward that was affected. This petition urged that the Anderson and Gettle houses be closed because daily, I love the way they wrote in the 1890s, because daily, quote, school teachers and other ladies were being insulted by harlots on the street. I was outside of Platt School. How many of you know what Platt School is? Do you know which one that is? It was named for, I believe, the mayor at the time because he's the guy that signed that ordinance. A new ordinance was passed, this one, which eventually closed down the district, and this was a death blow to the 20 plus years of occupancy in this area. And some of the things that, I'm not gonna read the whole thing to, it, to you, but uh, any person who shall be found guilty in regard to keeping a house of ill fame or prostitution uh, shall upon conviction be fined not less than $15 and not more than $50. And they will be committed until the fine is paid. So we're getting a little more serious here. $50 in a depression time, that's big money. And then, uh, let's see, it shall be duty as any person who should be found guilty of being an inmate or frequenter of any house, room or rooms kept, used or occupied, will be fined not less than five or more than $50, and they too will set committed until it's paid. And it shall be the duty of all policemen to arrest with or without warrant in person found violating the present uh, in provisions. All ordinance or parts uh, in conflict thereof are hereby repealed and it will take effect immediately as long as it's posted. So uh, expensive, we're getting serious now. Oh, and another term, the frequenter, you see that? It was people who rented rooms, not just in the brothels, but if you rented a room in a hotel or you rented a room in another house or were working in the streets, yuck you were a frequenter and could be arrested for that. So lots of ways to be arrested after the, uh, after the passing of this ordinance. Now, when you look back at the ordinance of 1891, which resulted in the closing of the former birth district in the area of Fifth and Elm, you might wonder where the evicted residents went. After the flurry of lawsuits by Nell Thompson had been settled, uh, the man who'd come here from Omaha rented a house on East 7th Street, purchased two of the houses in the now closed district, put them on wagons, and moved them to the new locations. This was probably close to the Burlington Railroad tracks. <coughs> Think about that for a minute. <laughs> As to where you are sitting yeah. right this minute. <laughs> so uh, following this move, the number of keepers addressed, arrested monthly, you remember the cycle where they arrested the keepers, they arrested them, you know, everybody paid the fine, the school, school, uh, school benefited. So, but following this move, uh, there were probably no more than two to four people arrested per month as, as keepers. So it had gone down almost half. And no more, and no more inmates were, were arrested. Uh, they were still arrested as, uh, as uh, being in the streets or wherever, but not here. This may have been, this is, we kind of talked about this, may, may have been because they, it was farther than City Hall now. And so it was uh, more of a to-do to hold them through the streets down to City Hall. That made them more visible and that made more people annoyed. And so it was up to the keepers now to support the schools. So we talked about, um, this wasn't necessarily an occupation of people just like, I want to grow up and be a prostitute. Unless your mom was. Unless your mom was or something, you know, maybe, you know, but most people, this was not the occupation they chose. And so that was the case with um, this next one that we're going to talk about. And um, 
Her name actually was Ella Finstermacher. Finstermacher. And um, she was born in Indiana right after the Civil War. Her father was a Civil War veteran. She was born into a really large farm family. Her father actually moved a whole family to Nebraska, went to Buffalo County, um, established a farm there. When she was 17 years old, um, she met her future husband. His name was Harley. She married him. Um, and so she was really a farmer's daughter who was destined to be a farmer's wife. Within a short period of time, she had three children. Um, one actually passed away, um, but so she still had two young children. And then sometime um, in the late 1890s, Harley died. And her father had also passed away by this time. So Ella now found herself with two little kids and no real good way to support herself or her children. So the 1900 census is um, when we actually first see Ella in her new career. Um, she placed her daughter with her widowed mother over in Buffalo County. Her son actually was living with her sister, uh, Lydia, and her husband, um, George Colley, here in Grand Island. And so somewhere around the age of 28, Ella opened her own house in Grand Island. And this is kind of interesting because the houses were all supposed to be closing. There wasn't supposed to be any new houses opening. This was, you know, this was after 1895, but Ella actually opened her own house in Grand Island. And um, in the 1900 census, it showed her listed on the census by the new name that she took, Venus Pasha. Okay. So um, the 1900 census showed that she was living in a house with six other women. She was the head of the house. She was only 28 years old. Um, the other women's occupations were listed as milliner, stenographer, dressmaker, clerk, maid, and cook. <laughs> so Ella had changed both her first name and her last name. She took the last name of the person who was her man about the place, people, who, uh, man who did work for her in the place. Interestingly enough, um, he had done some work, and there was actually a big article about this. He'd gone down into the cellar because the acetylene um, lamps had gone out and he tried to relight them, and there was an explosion, and so he was burned around the hand and face. Um, but his name was Tom Shaw. She would go ahead and later marry him, but in 1900, she already actually first took his name. Um, and it's interesting enough, her first name, does anyone know what Venus means? The goddess of love, yes. So from Ella to Venus, she was. Um, she kept her name, uh, well, the years that followed, she kept the name Venus, but then she resumed the first name of her first husband, her first married name, which was Ella Weber, or Weber. So when all is said and done and written, people involved in the trade were just that, they were people. And they had stories, and they had dreams. Not all, not all of them were realized. <coughs> but uh, their names were found, people whose names we found in newspaper articles. And, other places like that, and court records, sadly. Some of their names were unusual. Two of my favorite names, one was Maggie Mustard, <laughs> and another Light Jerome, who on earth was this? But probably many of them used names other than their own. Now Ella, slash Venus, slash all those, she changed hers pretty much as well. And I'm pretty sure that other people did too. Other women did as well. well now Venus was a madam who got, or a keeper, who got a lot of uh, publicity in her day. For one thing, she was arrested more than any other madam or any other prostitute in Grand Island. Her girls often violated Grand Island's law, which pro prohibited prostitutes from entering bars and saloons. One of them was May. She was, uh, in some court records, she was May, and other word, others she was Marie, but May or Marie Wilson. And uh, Eva Marquette were Weber girls who often violated the law charged with being a nuisance or with public drunkenness. And in fact, uh, May Wilson was found, according to the newspaper article, in the back of a hack uh, cab. And she passed out from being drunk. But they couldn't charge her with entering the saloon because she wasn't in the saloon. But she was drunk, and there were three empty liquor bottles there. So she was arrested and charged with being a public nuisance. So you can see. Alcohol entered into quite a bit of the problems that the ladies had and the girls had. Venus had a wonderfully grand brothel. It was located about a block north of here, 
on East 7th Street. I, the house cost over $10,000 to build, according to the Grand Island Independent, and it had more than 20 rooms decorated with, with the most costly furniture. The kitchen was a small, separate building. I'm sure they, she hoped it would not catch on fire and burn the house down because that happened. Unfortunately, in 1915, the house itself caught fire in the afternoon and within 20, 90 minutes it was completely ashes. Since it was outside the city water district, nothing could stop its destruction and only the parlor furniture and the grand piano were saved. And so in my own mind, I think it was on East 7th, yes. I'm wondering it wasn't across the tracks. I'm not sure where the, where the city water service ended, but you think, considering how you were doing in those days, that's probably where it was. So when you go outside today, just look up there and think of Venus. <laughs> Shortly after the fire, Venus Weber and her business partner, or partner, I'm going, uh, William Flick left Grand Island. Now it was said, the Venus was so tough that she served as her own bouncer. <laughs> uh, she must have had a softer side, as when any of her girls died, she paid the funeral costs. When Taft Courtney died in June of 1905 of blood poisoning, Venus paid the funeral costs of $57. Of note is the funeral of Marie, also known as May, Wilson, who committed suicide in August 1910. She was 24 years old. She was the one who was caught in the half man one time. But Venus paid those costs as well. And the total costs uh, for burying uh, Marie were $272. Venus paid cash for that. And her stone here is in the north side of the cemetery. And you know this, what do you know is differently about this? Different about the stone. First name only, and the day of her death. So I think she must have been uh, special to Venus. Well, then also, Sue said it was two hundred seventy dollars she paid for the funeral. That didn't include the stone. Oh yeah, and the stone was actually... really doesn't do a lot of justice to it, but this is a pretty significant stone, so it would have been costly. Right. But. Um, she also, before she left Nebraska, she had, there's another stone placed over in a rural Buffalo County Cemetery, uh, Parley Weber, it was her first husband. So again, I think Venus had a real sentimental, softer side. Uh, Parley has a really nice, significant stone too. Um, so after the fire, Venus was again Ella, and she left Nebraska forever. And, um, I know Sue had mentioned her partner, William Flick, at this time. Um, what I had found was after this period of time, her son and her daughter, Joseph and Eva, left with her. They left Nebraska with her. They all went out to Seattle. Um, Eva and Joseph both married in Seattle. Um, Eva, however, she died in childbirth shortly after she was married. Um, Joseph married, had two young children. And he was living with Eva, or with Ella at this time, who now took the name of Ella Pasha, so the name of her second husband. Um, and so in census records, she is listed as Ella Pasha, and her son, Joseph Weber, and his family are living with her in a hotel that she owns in Seattle, Washington. There's over 40 different individuals, men and women of various occupations, who all live in this hotel with her. So she really did well for herself. Again, this wasn't a career occupation that she chose. She kind of fell into it. Um, but she, once she left it, she shook, shook the dust off and she made a name for herself. She did actually marry one more time in 1927 to a man by the name of Charles um, Sundholm. So in 1910, kind of leads us up to here, and Venus, is Ella over here, Ella Weber, and her two children, Joe and Eva, are living with her. And it might be kind of hard to see on this, but actually, these two pages are pretty much all the same. This is all the same area. And it's interesting, 1910, we weren't so squeamish about actually giving people's occupations a word on the census. You know, I told you earlier, it was like servant, milliner, cook, whatever. We have 
Prostitute, 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 bartender, prostitute, 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 prostitute,
Williamson Furniture was also a location. And the Savoy Hotel, that's what it's called then, I don't know what it's called now. It's so located on the south, um, southwest corner of Sycamore and East South. Now think about that, put it where it is. Sycamore underpass. On the southwest corner uh, was, uh, anyway, it was running an illegal house prostitution. Another story that we, the building is still there. Another story that we got from the independent. A raid on the business in 1921 resulted in gunfire, a, a shootout, and the former police chief, he was working there as a security guard. <laughs> <laughs> he shot a police officer who was taking part in the raid, and they both ended up in the hospital. So it was uh, the former police chief was also shot during the melee, and it was big news for days. <laughs> Although many of you might have been surprised to hear that there would be enough material for us to talk for even 10 minutes about the world's oldest profession here in Grand Island, of all places, I hope you now know that prostitution not only existed here, it thrived while it was here. And it was as much part of the growth of our city as was the blacksmith, the livery stable, the grocery store, any other business, any other citizen. We thank you. <laughs> any questions or did we fill your curiosity cup up the bread there? Yes, sir. Are you going to take the floor in 1921? Probably not. Okay, he hasn't asked it yet. But oh, the first question. Oh, he said, are we going to continue our study in the middle of the house? House above the chicken coop. What was that known as? He, the question was, the house above the chicken coop, what was that known as? I don't know what that was actually known as. And, and like we said, we know the prostitution continued on. You've all heard the stories during World War II. And even I remember Gene Buddy talking about one time he was sitting like in the second story of the Lions or something or some building downtown. The building that was there before the Lions. Building that was there before the YMCA. And he actually watched the people go in and out of the houses. But what they were called, I don't know the answer to that. What? Yeah. The what now?
yes, we did see names we knew that were listed. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we did see some familiar names and thought, hmm. But I do thank you for coming. Thank you so much for coming, Bill. I hope you enjoyed it as much as you did.